It is my honor and privilege to introduce to you the next speaker for this afternoon, member of Knesset Zehava Galon, who is the leader of the Meretz Party. I think that even if you don't support her political path, you cannot but be impressed with her commitment to values and to the path that she represents, from her deep commitment to Zionism, to the State of Israel, and therefore we are much honored to have her here as our speaker this afternoon. Member of Knesset, have a girl on. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here and to follow Member of Knesset Herzog. And before I begin speaking, I just have one small comment to make. There's no such thing as a center block without the left wing. It would be impossible to replace the current regime without the left wing. So just so you know, head of the Zionist camp, Herzog. Distinguished guests. Five days after the Six-Day War, during a discussion in the government, Member of Government Menachem Begin asked one question, and I would like to repeat it out loud. He asked, what are we going to do with the Arabs? Fifty years later, this question continues to be a point of attention. What, is going to do with the, what are we going to do with the Arabs? It is a decisive point of elections and the pillar of fire around which the parties in Israel, the Nargila, as Mayor Ariel said, at the end of every sentence in Hebrew. Because if today, 50 years later, we're still asking ourselves the same question almost 70 years after the inception of the State of Israel, then over the last 50 years one can only assume Israel did not give any answers. And even though the political system always talks about the conflict in any way, in any constellation, about the conflict with the Palestinians, and we see that this uh, discussion or discourse is always very uh, surface level, uh, has uh, all sorts of slogans in it. And I want to talk to the right. What are the solutions offered and suggested by the right? What does Bennett give us? What does the Prime Minister offer? What are they offering? the Israeli society. And I'd like to start with Kalkilia as an analogy. Take this crisis around the construction of Kalkilia. I think it's a good analogy because in the press, this is reported as part of the coalition game, the main rule of which is that there is a tough competition. Who hates Arabs more? Who wants to be, to, to have a flag of allegiance for the settlers more? But the entire discussion politically is around the fact that the cabinet were willing to give the Palestinians 5,000 units of residence for the next 18 years. And then I heard Bennett be interviewed, and he was also here this morning, and I understand in his interview how he explained that he is not willing that Palestinians build on Route 6. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, I have news for him. Kalkilia is on Route 6 already. It has been for a long time, and the only reason that Bennett is against this construction is completely different, and he just happened to say it in an interview, and I'd like to quote a sentence out of that interview. He said, and I quote, clearly the Arabs need to live somewhere. There's no disagreement about that. That's nice already. But there's a lot of open spaces in the Palestinian Authority, in Judea and Samaria. Before you get to Judea and Samaria, there are plenty of open spaces. Must they live in Kalkilia? Okay, so now we suddenly understand everything. Suddenly... The transferist came uh, out of the defense man's uh, mask because he didn't care about Route 6. All he really cares about is the fact that there are Palestinians in Area C, and he, th he thinks that if there won't be construction, maybe there won't be Palestinians in Area C, and if they don't have Palestinians in Area C, then maybe we can just annex it, which is really the highlight of his plan. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, it's called a transfer through construction. Because you sit in one room, some of those denying the occupation, the profits of the economic peace, there's something like that now, and they're, and they're arguing whether Palestinians can build in Kalkilia or not. And following this discussion in the cabinet, I'm asking you, do you think it is conceivable that that is what high officials are being blamed for, and that's why the government is about to collapse? And that's what's being offered by the Minister of Education. And we are given opinions as defense, because and this is something that's very c uh, troubling. Because when Minister of Education Bennett says, and I quote, that a nation cannot be an occupier in their own land, he's saying one thing, that the Bible is the one that outlines the boundaries of this and the borders of this country. And when he takes out a coin from Jerusalem to prove that Jews were here 2,000 years ago, he is in fact stating that the state of Israel is a sovereign, modern state that invests all of its resources in a lost and ongoing adventure, a bloody adventure in the territories. But if in 2017 the Bible outlines Israel's boundaries, then I must ask some questions of Minister Bennett. I would like to get an explanation. Why aren't we sending soldiers to occupy the Gilad? The Jordanians have it now. If we're going by the Bible, why aren't we sending troops to take over the Bashan, which is way in Syria? And how is it that Bennett is so easily giving up the entire promised land? And I'm asking Bennett, how come you can give up Iraq, Syria, Lebanon? Why aren't we building settlements there? The Iraqi regime is weak. Syria is slaughtering its citizens and about to collapse. So we have a historic opportunity. But perhaps, with all due respect to our deep religious connection the Jews have to their, te to their land, and no one is, has any argument over Jewish right to the land of Israel, we are talking about how it's going to do, be done, how we're going to implement this right. If this is a state that is trying to be reasonable and sovereign, perhaps it should take consideration, other considerations. And the Bible cannot be the consideration that dictates our actions here. Look what's happening here. Just so that Bennett and his friends can take a little piece of the land, of the promised land, so that the messianic group can be happy with history. An entire country sends their boys and girls to be killed on borders that cannot be protected and we have to say that we cannot protect them and Bennett knows it and his friends knows it, know it but that's why we see now 50 years to the occupation of the Palestinians and the territories that we are in an entire project of denial, denying occupation and an attempt strangely to talk about defense and a plan that is completely has no basis economically or politically. And we have to say that the settlement enterprise is a religious project in disguise. And anyone sitting in this room, or not even in this room, we are all paying the price for this delusion. It's a religious project in disguise. And if we're talking about a religious project, then let's talk about Jerusalem. Once every so often, when we talk about the settlements in Jerusalem, suddenly all of the slogans, the defense-related slogans, disappear, and suddenly the truth comes out. I will quote again the Minister of, De of, in of Education, Bennett. He said in the Haaretz conference, I was there, he said, Jerusalem is above all rationale, better to have a united Jerusalem than a peace agreement. Okay, I see there's some support for what Bennett had to say. Better a united Jerusalem than a peace agreement. But with all due respect, I am saying to say that Jerusalem is above all rationale, that's a sophisticated way of saying that you have no intention of being rational and preferring this fiction called a united Jerusalem over a peace agreement, that means to those who applauded here to prefer symbolic control of Walaje and Shu'afat. Did we pray for Walaje and Shu'afat? Did we pray for control over 300, 400,000 Palestinians in Jerusalem to prefer that over the chance that Israeli citizens and soldiers can return home alive? Is Jerusalem some sort of metaphysical idea? It's a city. It exists. And it's time that we stop imposing upon its inhabitants these ambiguous ideas 
pillars of Jerusalem of above and to acknowledge that there are people here first and foremost and under any agreement they will have to be taken into consideration and there has to be compromise in Jerusalem if we have an agreement it will be open to all and sovereignty has to be shared in it and we must remember we must remember and it's true that ideals are eternal but we don't they don't need us they can do very well on their own without us so who dictates the actual policies of the government and i deliberately spoke with about bennett first i know that the prime minister uh, is uh, the prime minister but when he doesn't even remember what was said about calcalia during protective edge but the shadow that is threatening and intimidating him and hovering above him is Bennett. And he's warned us that this won't actually keep to the, sta the international standards. But ultimately, when he does pass that bill about the arrangement law, it is Bennett's shadow that is w blowing down his neck. But this is a hostile taking an overtaking and a taking over of the settlers and the extremist writers. And we've seen how Rolden Crow um, and Gilden Crows have suddenly popped their houses, up, their faces up again. And we've seen it in Jerusalem. We've seen it in the West Bank. It's all happening again. Now, Bibi Netanyahu, as far as I'm concerned, it's a fact. He's broken all the actual records of Ben-Gurion. It's now eight or nine years. Now, just think that time can be a gift, but it can also show your true colors and what you're capable of doing, because the right in his hands, he was given a golden opportunity to really start that process the negotiating process and yes there are security considerations that need to dictate all the arrangement but if you're talking about that kind of security discussion about the future of the territories that's a bit fictitious it reminds me the kind of sort of discussion between the scientists and the deniers of global warming. It's the same idea. Do you remember the prime minister's discussion, how he supported the two-state two solution at the Bari land famous speech? Well, he also sort of whitewashed Kushnir. Believe me, Bari Lan's speech was actually, when he, le when he spoke there, was also mendacious. And he's also lying to Kushner. All he really wants is his political survival. And so what is really threatening the state of Israel and what interests Bibi Netanyahu is either managing the conflict, and because that's what he's doing, or his personal survival. And one is at the expense of the other. Netanyahu always chooses the most, sort of the dearest thing to his heart, that is himself. And his whole concept about managing the conflict reflects a mendacious status quo. And uh, you remember that? that driver of the jeep who's got his wheels stuck and entrenched in a quagmire of mud well that's exactly the same situation that he's in just the way how you basically are uh, fight a fire when you use those kind of um extinguishing power that basically is just extinguishing your own power that is what he's using and in fact it's just inflaming more and more so now, if we think, when we're talking about that decision of the State of Israel to be now with the electricity in the Gaza Strip, are we going to be the performing contractor on behalf of Abu Mazen? We're going to be the ones who are going to give them less electricity. Who's going to pay the, the price of that? What's the logic embedded in that? Who's going to pay? We're going to pay for it. And all the, the people in, in the Gaza Strip and the people surrounding the Gaza Strip in Israel, he has been a passive player in a dynamic surroundings. Now, if I look at the Prime Minister and and he's looking at the erosion of the state of Israel in the eyes of the international arena. And what is he so what is he glorifying himself with about his achievements in Togo and Liberia? So what yes, ladies and gentlemen, 
I say that a, stale, a state that wants to live and survive and be vibrant should take its destiny in its own hands. We were established because they always thought of solutions for problems, and they already envisioned kibbutzim instead of the wilderness, and they helped neighborhoods flourish where there was nothing before. So in the reality that we live in, a state that is now uh, at the outcome of 50 years of occupation and the state that they are talking of apartheid. I would like to remind you that in the Knesset, when we spoke about certain things and, and apartheid and, and, and ethnic clen cleansing, then we walked out of the assembly at the Knesset and now they talk about it openly. Well, and members of Knesset can show contempt towards children who were killed as soldiers in protective edge, edge in front of the cameras. Is this a, ca a state that should continue surrendering and giving in to the demands and the fantasies, the anarchistic and, an, and archaic fantasies of Naftali Benik? Is, is that what we want? Definitely not. But does that really is that really what the government wants? Even if we progress towards an arrangement and some kind of agreement with the Palestinians, then, then we need to do things differently. And uh, yes, we will have to. I don't delude myself. I know that a two-state solution is the only realistic solution. And I know we'll have to make concessions and there will be a cost for that instead of sort of unrestrained, wild construction outside the settlement blocks. If he thinks that the, the, the actual wounds of the conflict will be scarred and then healed, in one fell swoop and instead we'll see gardens of flowers. Forget it, we're deluding ourselves. And we cannot actually delude ourselves and forget the permanent borders of the status of Israel. We don't want to wake up in 50 years time and ask ourselves the same question that after six day war, the Begins asked himself, what will happen with the Arabs? Well, I think we should start that discussion in earnest because people's lives are at stake and we cannot continue managing that conflict with peeping over it in that direction. Did Herz Herzog send Livni? Did he talk to Netanyahu? Did he go to Kerry? Will Trump bring an agreement or not? We cannot continue managing it like that with little spillovers into here and into there. I think that this should be a sine qua non that we do something about it. We cannot delay this anymore. I would just like to say I belong to those who do not lose hope and I truly believe that it is incumbent upon us to change that reality and to reject those alternatives offered by the right-wingers and pave the path to a real peace, and that for the sake of posterity. And, I'm, and people from the solidarity in their famous struggle in Poland said, in Gdansk, they said the following sentence, and I would like to conclude with that. He said that even if the winter is hard, it will not prevent the coming of spring. Thank you very much.